welcome to the Assembling Inclusion podcast. On this show, we feature different programs, individuals, and initiatives focused on being more inclusive of individual needs. We invite you to learn right alongside us. If you want some additional resources or access to our courses, please visit our website or follow us on social media. But for right now, let's get right to the episode. Today's episode is super exciting as we dive into the world of Molly and Lexi from the picture book series, Everyday Adventures with Molly and Dyslexia, with author Krista Weltner. When I first heard about the series, I was so excited about the idea of authentic representation for children reading these books, as well as the choice to personify dyslexia through a character. After my conversation with Krista, I got the series and actually added it to my home library. It's something that I would have 100% used in my classroom for my students, and I definitely recommend that our educator listeners offer it to their students. Anyway, I just want to jump right into this conversation so we can learn more from Krista, so let's get started. Welcome back to the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. Today, we're joined by Krista Weltner. We're going to be discussing her newest picture book series, Everyday Adventures with Molly and Dyslexia. Krista, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. So before we jump into your new book series, I wanted to know if you could introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I wear a lot of hats. I'm an artist, author, illustrator, but I've also worked in stop motion animation, Some of my work could be seen in Netflix animations, Wendell and Wild. And there's also a film called Wildwood, which is upcoming with Leica Studios that I also worked on. I have a background in theater and I've also worked in the theme park industry, making animatronic puppets for theme parks. So I'm kind of all over the place, but lately I've been really focused on writing and illustrating. I love that you have so many different experiences. That's really awesome how you have so much, you know, diverse range of experiences to draw from. So leading into that, can you discuss what actually led you to create your new picture book series? What was the inspiration for getting started with that? I would say the inspiration has been kind of ongoing since I was young. I was diagnosed with dyslexia when I was seven years old. And then I went through this entire sort of phase in my life in adolescence where I really disliked this part of myself. And then I grew to love it later in my 20s. And I also did a lot of research at that time because I was making a short film about dyslexia. And that sort of snowballed into some advocacy work to do with dyslexia, which made me want to continue making work, especially for young children, about this topic. The inspiration has been ongoing, but ultimately what I wanted to do with these books was to share the emotional challenges that can come with dyslexia. I think so often with material for children in this category because it's a picture book so it's a short form of storytelling you only have so many pages to tell your story but because we had three books we were able to cover more topics and go in depth into those deeper issues that are not always talked about i was really drawn to the book series when i saw about it online because i thought It was something that when I was a teacher, my students would have loved. Even though they were in middle school, we always had picture books in the classroom just because there's so many great picture books out there. And I think the representation would have been amazing for them because so many of them were struggling. Not not just students who had dyslexia, but a lot of them did have dyslexia. Struggling with, you know, who they were and feeling how they felt about having dyslexia, things like that. So I appreciate that you drew from your own experience and really put this out there so students can see themselves represented in text. So I noticed in your series that you personified dyslexia and you made the character Lexi through that lens. So how do you think that approach, you know, impacts and contributes to the book's message? Well, it was really important for me to convey the relationship a person can have towards a part of themselves, because that has been so much a part of my journey is how I have felt about this piece of myself and how I've gone from the transition of sort of hating this bit of myself to loving this bit of myself. And by personifying dyslexia, I'm able to show my main character, Molly, having a relationship to her dyslexia and being able to, you know, at times not get along with her dyslexia and at times really embrace her dyslexia and work with her dyslexia 
yeah, the personification was always a part of the story from its inception. Actually, this whole thing began with an illustration for an art contest. And I was wanting to do something around dyslexia, and it was for a dyslexic charity. And my friend challenged me to draw my dyslexia as a character. And after this illustration, I began imagining what I would say to my dyslexia if I could. What would I tell my dyslexia? What would it be like if I could tell my dyslexia to go away? Could my dyslexia go away? The answer is no, obviously. I really like the personification piece. I always go back to my students because that's where my mind usually goes first. I think that would have been great for them to see that you don't always love every part of yourself, but it's always there. So I appreciate that you made that connection. I think that's something that really would have been impactful for children reading the book. And you had mentioned this a little bit, but I saw that one of the goals for the series that you have is to empower the children to embrace their strengths. So how do Molly and Lexi navigate and highlight the strengths that they have throughout the adventures that they have across the series? Yeah, we show their strengths throughout the series, but we have focused on different parts of dyslexia throughout the series. So the third book is actually the one that's focused on personal strengths, research backs dyslexia strengths like three-dimensional reasoning, creative problem solving, future prediction, empathy, all these known traits that dyslexic children can have. So we focus more on that in the third book, but we were able to show those strengths throughout. And Molly is an individual who's a lot like myself, so she's very creative and bright. Throughout the series, repeatedly, we show that Molly is very intelligent. And this was a very important piece for me, too, just for all children to know that dyslexia is often a a marker of high intelligence, if not average intelligence. And so that's an important bit of it. I think... Also, what's great about our series is we have two dyslexic characters. There's a secondary character that comes in in book two, and her name's Leanne. And so each of their personified dyslexias look different because dyslexia can present differently, you know, in different people. So Leanne's strengths are more in science and engineering. She's more of the like analytical kind of type, whereas Molly's the big picture thinker, you know, out of the box creative type. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't realize there were secondary characters who also have their own dyslexia character. That's really awesome. Um, And also, we don't go into it in the book because it's only three books. But in the background, too, I've chosen to represent other learning differences as well. I think there's a kid with dyscalculia. There's another one who's got like an undiagnosed character who's kind of amorphous. We don't really know what it is. And some ADHD. And we've chosen to represent everyone. Oh, that's really awesome. I, I love anytime there's anything in the background that I could like extra close take a look at. So that's really cool that there's additional learning disabilities thrown in there as well. It's such a great idea for representation. I love that you represented the two characters with dyslexia with two different variations, because that's one of the things on the show we always talk about is like one person with a disability is one person with a disability and there's so many variations. So I appreciate that. There's the focus on that as well. You had mentioned a couple different moments in the series, but are there any specific ones that stand out to you that you think will really resonate with readers? Obviously not giving away like spoilers for the book, but is there anything kind of big picture that you think readers will identify with? I think book one is a really great place to start if an educator or a parent is looking for something to start the conversation about dyslexia. In the first book, Molly doesn't actually know she's dyslexic, and that book is about kind of learning how to ask for help. She's dealing with an internal struggle with her and her dyslexia named Lexi about whether she should ask her teacher for help, and she eventually does. And then also in that book, she gets diagnosed. So that's kind of like a story of getting diagnosed. There's a a moment in book two, which I feel is definitely the most powerful for me, especially as a dyslexic adult, having come through it and been on the other side of it, where Lexi and Molly are kind of at odds. And They're at odds over whether or not to tell her class that she's dyslexic because Leanne has arrived and Leanne is dyslexic. And day one, she comes into class and says, this is my dyslexia, Izzy. And she introduces the class to her little character. But because Molly hasn't chosen to be open about the dyslexia, her personification, her little imaginary friend is invisible. So they're at odds about whether to make her visible. There's one picture book spread that has been in there since the very beginning, like doodles of this book, where Lexi has expanded to the size of the room. Usually she's, I don't know, maybe like a foot tall in our universe. But in this spread, she's gotten really angry with Molly and she has expanded to be the size of their art classroom. They're in art at the time. And 
I think that imagery is just so powerful. Oh, I love that conflict too. Because I think that's something that I've heard and I've seen is the student's internal struggle with whether or not to reveal that information to people. And what I think is really cool too is that this is a book that could be read to an entire class so that students with dyslexia will feel seen and represented. But then the other students will have a better understanding too of what their classmates are going through. Or maybe it'll give them an avenue to open up if they feel so inclined to open up to their class. It's a great conversation starter. And both ways are totally valid and wonderful if you want to keep it private or not. When I was a kid, my dyslexia got exposed to my classroom kind of without my permission. Well, definitely without my permission. And on the playground, I didn't know how to explain. So this book is about helping kids have a positive way to talk about their differences if they want to, if they choose. And if that conversation surprises them, hopefully this book would help a child be more prepared. It's a great way of looking at it. And I'm sorry that it was exposed without your permission. That's okay. It was an awful moment where I had a substitute teacher who didn't understand the instructions that my regular teacher had left. And so she wrote all these spelling words up on the board and she circled like 10 out of 20. And she said, okay, Krista, copy these. Everyone else copy everything else, which normally was like a private thing that happened. I would write the spelling words down and my teacher would privately let me know which words were mine. And the class just erupted. And I'm not sorry that it happened now because it has inspired so much. And I hope that it will go back into the universe with a lot of good out of my art and my books and my film. Well, I think that those experiences then, they've helped channel the book. They honestly, I think they'll help students in the future, which is a really positive thing. And going off of that, we kind of talked about this already a little bit, but how do you envision the series helping to foster empathy for all children? That's something that I think is always the struggle. I taught teenagers, so sometimes a challenge when my students were mixing in with their peers and there was a lot of questions and conversations. So how do you think this will help? So I hope that my series can help foster that empathy in all children just by giving them an avenue to start discussing it. These books were really written with an intended audience in mind that was towards the upper end of the picture book age. You know, these are kids that are starting to think critically about their world. And these books with the personification of dyslexia help make something that is an invisible difference visible and thereby helping aid in conversations and discussions around it. I was also with a fantastic publisher, Free Spirit Publishing, which is an educational publisher. So I feel like we were able to think really strongly about all of those goals and We involved a piece of back matter in every book that is specific to that book, which helps aid in discussions about the topic in the book. So we talked a little bit about how this story will help, obviously, children with dyslexia, but then also their classmates to start conversations. But what advice would you give to parents, teachers, caregivers who want to support and empower the dyslexic children in their life based on the lessons that you're providing in your books? I think for parents and educators, my biggest piece of advice to keep in mind is that there's probably a whole internal world going on inside that that child's head about what's going on and to do their best to just support the child in their self-esteem. In my advocacy work, I see a lot of different types of families. And I think it is really important to help that child through, of course, with reading and writing and spelling and getting tutoring and whatever that child needs, but also to remember that they need to feel positive about something too. So if they have a strength that's popping out or an interest to just try to go with that. For me, when I was young reading, interest played a huge uh, topic. If I was interested in a topic, we could go find a book about it. I was 10 times more likely to invest in taking the time to get through that text. Also, this is kind of random, but and I have no idea if there's any research on this, but someone should do some research on it. I always found that working on or reading books that were adaptations of movies and films really helped me because I was able to get a vibe for the story, fall in love with the characters, and then I wanted to find out more. So I would go find the book and find out more about that world. And that really helped me early on as well. I think that's really great advice from both sides. From, you know, the teacher perspective, I love the engaging through interests. That was always something so big, but so easy to implement as a teacher. I taught reading and just being able to let students pick their own books really was so helpful. Then I love the point that you made about 
moving just beyond the focus on teaching reading and writing. I think that's where everybody jumps to right away. I would sit in meetings with parents and I'd be like, I want them to read this way. I want them to write this way. Missing right. the fact that there are so many strengths that their child had that I'm like, you could be capitalizing and nurturing this because they are amazing in X, Y, or Z. Like, I, I love that advice. And that's really helpful. Both things are really important for sure. So what future plans or goals do you have for Everyday Adventures with Molly and Dyslexia? Do you have any more stories that you're hoping to add on to the series or are there any other ideas or anything that you're looking to do in the future for Molly and Lexi? Right now, I'm just hoping to get get these three books out in the world, which our publication day is fast approaching. I think it'll be out by the time this podcast goes live, which is crazy to think. So I'm really focused on those three books and trying to get them into the hands of the kids that need them most. But beyond that, yeah, I would love to continue working on Molly and Lexi. I have several more ideas, but all that depends on what's going on with my publisher and how well these first three books do. So we'll see. That's really awesome. There's a lot of stories I think you could tell within that space. There are so many perspectives and ideas. I I could see students really latching on to the stories because it's great to see yourself reflected back in what you're reading. So I could imagine that, you know, students would be really engaged by this type of series. Absolutely. And when I first approached my publisher, it was actually just one story. And they came back to me and said, what do you think about a series? So we went back and forth for a while and I pitched a lot of ideas and they also brought in some of their ideas. So I could definitely see us expanding it and going back and looking at some of those earlier pitches. Maybe we make something out of those. (laughs) And I'll be excited to follow along the journey and see if anything else comes out from it too. I I wanted to kind of end on a broad note. How do you think that your book series will contribute to like a broader conversation about neurodiversity and representation in children's literature specifically. I know there's been a larger push for it, which is amazing. I feel like when I first started teaching, there was barely any books about neurodiversity and I was struggling to find things that my students could relate to. And I feel like it's starting to get a little bit better, but how do you think this will, you know, help in that grand scheme of things? That is an amazing question. I think that it's very interesting because you know, publishing takes a long time. So it was a few years ago when I first started talking with the publisher and everything. So at that time, I did like a market survey and I looked at the other books out there. And some of the most popular books, especially picture books to do with dyslexia are kind of dated. They're wonderful, but they're sort of dated. And there's not a lot of books out there that are actually by dyslexic authors. I hope that this book would help contribute to that narrative of representation by the people who actually experience those things. Not to say that a brilliant educator who's a specialist with dyslexia couldn't create a wonderful picture book. In fact, we need that voice too. But I can bring something different to the table because I've lived that experience. So I hope that it can contribute in that way. I think that's such an important consideration, the idea of like own voice. That is a struggle. I think there are so many books and that's Something that we try to do on this show, like me recognizing, obviously, I don't have the same experience as everybody else. So letting the guests open up and share their perspectives, I think that's really appreciated because there's a nice authenticity to it then. And the students, I don't know, I always felt like my students could see through it if somebody really didn't understand what they were going through. But like, this is something they could be like, oh, no, I know exactly how that feels. I'm going through it. And it's great to see a character go through it as well in a really authentic way. So I think that's really, that's important. And it's also important to me to, in my advocacy work, especially with children, that they see themselves, you know, hopefully in me, like as a successful author, we show images of other successful dyslexic people, you know, Einstein, Steven Spielberg, like all these people. But success doesn't always mean like a famous person. It's also just a thriving adult who's working and pursuing their passions. Oh, yeah, I definitely think that's important. So just to close us off, could you tell us and our listeners where we can find out more about the Everyday Adventures with Molly and Dyslexia or any other work or anything you have going on? So Everyday Adventures with Molly and Dyslexia will be out at end of January with Free Spirit Publishing. You can purchase it through any local bookstore. You can also go to Amazon. It, it should be there as well. And also I want to say, because I did quickly mention my short film, that's available for free on YouTube. It's a 10-minute short film called Partially Compensated. And I'm just so grateful you had me on here today. This was so much fun. 
<laughs> no, thank you so much, Krista, for joining us. And I'm going to make sure to drop all those links that you had just mentioned to the book from Amazon and from, you know, I think there's a way to search for local. I'm going to find that out too. So I can handle Oh, bookshop. Yeah. Bookshop. That's what it is. Yeah. I'm going to make sure to link both. I'll do Amazon. I'll do bookshop. And I will also do your film as well. So anybody listening, you can just pop into the show description or our transcript at the bottom and you can just check it right out. But thank you, Krista, so much for sharing about your series with us. I can't wait to purchase it, to add it to my daughter's library. And I would have bought it for my classroom when I was still in the classroom. But thank you so much for sharing your experiences and all of the great work you're doing with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. I hope the information in this episode taught you something new, gave you a new idea, or showcased a new perspective. If you liked the episode, feel free to leave us a review or a comment. If you have a recommendation for an individual or an organization who would make a great guest, you can message us or send us an email at assemblinginclusion at gmail.com. See you next time.